bill. And uh, it's the button there. We're in uh, the second letter of Paul to Timothy. suggesting is that Paul writes this letter to, and we often look at these letters as kind of treatises for our benefit. And I think they are brought down to us by the providence of God through the spirit that we might have these words, but at the same time, they're written to a person and they're written in a certain set of circumstances. And so I was suggesting last time that perhaps Paul I had some reason to be concerned about Timothy. You know, there was communication in the Roman Empire. Paul in prison at Rome would get news from what's happening in Ephesus, even though that was a long way off. And that's where Timothy, from what we understand, was serving, hundreds of miles away. And yet, they'd get news back and forth what was going on. Paul was very interested in the work throughout the world where he had preached and uh, established congregations. And so, uh, as I said, sometimes we think of the uh, ministers, if you will, uh, and God's messengers in the New Testament is, you know, perfect beings, but they were subject to fatigue. They were subject to temptation and fear. And perhaps Paul sensed a little of that in the case of Timothy. In any event, he's trying to bolster his faith to, to make sure that he stays true to the Lord. And we have every confidence that he did, but we'd like to know more details, I guess. Anyway, uh, so we're looking at the first, what we call the first chapter of the second letter to Timothy. And uh, uh, we talked about uh, fanning the flame that had been given to him through the laying on of Paul's hands. And then he goes on, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. And we've seen this type of admonition to Timothy before. Let no man despise thy youth in one case. Here, you need to have a, a spirit of power. Uh, do we have a spirit of power today? Thanks, we Thanks, should. Yeah. yeah. What does that mean to have a spirit of power? I think it just means that we can do whatever God wants us to do. Okay. Because of his power in us. We don't have to be afraid. <clears throat> and we can have confidence when we speak out for Christ, when we speak out for the Lord that it bear fruit. And uh, so we need not have timidity, I guess is one of the words that uh, is used. It, interesting, a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. A spirit of self-discipline. The spirit, if you will, uh, motivates us and helps us to have self-discipline so that we can have greater power and greater love. Anyway. Uh, you also would, yeah. you know, self-discipline and love because, I mean, you can feel like you have a spirit of power but that can lead you in the wrong direction and yeah. you can yeah. be going after the wrong kind of power or using that feeling of power 
for the wrong things and you know trying to get dominance yeah, that's over the word people, I was thinking rather than, uh, trying to to uh, be of service to them yeah yeah <clears throat> so it's the power is tempered by love and self-discipline and so I like the King James sound mind. Okay. That's the thing. It's going to be crazy. But I just my young. That's what they do. Oh, I like crazy. Sound mind. <laughs> and and you, you could also be looking at that power uh, to impose your beliefs okay. on someone. And mm -hmm. I, you know, not to say that our beliefs are wrong, but if we're going to try to impose them on people, before they're ready, yeah. say, to accept it, it's mm -hmm. just not going to work. And then, you know, rather than love, we have to kind of use oppression to, to keep yeah. people under control if we're trying to use power for the wrong reason. And uh, when you see that, and it has been done in the name of Christ, but it's, it's not a real conversion. Uh, I Jean, think yes. Sometimes, if you don't have the spirit of power, you get to a place where you be fearless to speak even the word of God yeah. to people. But the word needs to be preached everywhere, no okay. matter whom is their gathering is, whom they are believed in. Yours is to bring out the word yeah. for them to hear. That is the power God has given you. So the stories make you fearless. Like uh, you read the First Corinthians chapter two, I think eight to nine. What Paul wrote to the Corinthians that what he is speaking is not from I mean to impress people or something to impress yeah. people. <clears throat> the spirit from God. That is what is coming out for them right. to hear. <coughs> so when the Spirit is leaving you, everywhere you are, you say, I need to bring the word here. I need to preach here. I want okay. people to hear the word here. That's so be point. fearless, but be sober and be respect to everyone. Like the mom was saying, yes, you may have people who will encounter with you that your religion doesn't matter for us or this kind of thing. Those kind of things bring fear on you or put fear on you that ah, those are many who fear, they don't believe in my religion. Or what I'm saying, if you don't take care, then you become what? Your spirit will be down. Yeah. But if you have the spirit of fear in you, as the Bible was saying, not all day I experience this order. Because you know very well that you are not liberal on what you are saying. You are saying what the Spirit is directing you to say. If you listen, listen. If you don't want to listen, fair enough. It goes on. Yeah. Do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner. That's it. Why would people be ashamed? Well, Paul's in prison, you know, maybe you don't want to really be associated with someone who's in prison, even though he hasn't done anything wrong. Uh, ashamed. Maybe, uh, what are we afraid of? <laughs> what are we afraid of? Well, you might be afraid that if you're, if you're associated with the person who's in prison, you might end up there yourself. Okay. Um, if they're, you know, they're okay, they're being unfairly punished for something, uh, and, or and they haven't really done anything. And, and again, you, you might be accused of the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And that day, more perhaps than what we experience where we are, uh, there's that fear of persecution, maybe. Uh, Physical harm, imprisonment. Mostly, a lot of we we fear ridicule. Perhaps we fear people just won't listen, or people will disagree. I don't know. 
we need to have greater boldness, I think is what. And I think there's a two differences there. Okay. There's a difference between fear and shame. Okay. If you are ashamed to bring the gospel, that is not a fear. You are ashamed to bring it. In, because you are standing on something to be ashamed of. If I'm ashamed to near my over there, that means I have something in me myself and I'm ashamed of. Not that I, it's a fear. But the fear is different from the ashamed, being ashamed to bring the gospel. Yeah. But Paul was telling Timothy, do not be ashamed. That means stand fair everywhere you are. Yeah. Don't be ashamed to bring out the gospel. People who encounter you, like you say, Paul was in prison. Yeah. Peter went to prison before. Yeah. And people know about it. And you are saying this, uh, why your people are in prison and this kind of things, and you are telling us this kind of things. If those things really make you ashamed of the gospel, bring it out. Let people know you're a Christian. That's right. Now he goes on and talk about imprisonment. Join me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Join me in suffering. Paul thought it a great thing to suffer because that way he was more like Jesus, his Lord. I think most of us would say, I don't want to suffer. It's not a great way to uh, invite someone. To <laughs> <Yeah. do Well. laughs> He's talking, telling, turning our attitude, trying to turn our attitude around. That, that uh, you, and we talked about that. We, you need to press. You need to confront. And the uh, Paul and the other disciples then were rejoicing if they had the opportunity to suffer in some ways like Jesus did. They came out in Acts rejoicing at suffering. Paul says in another place, I haven't yet suffered in every way like Christ. I've suffered in some way. And he lists <laughs> all different ways he's suffered, beatings, imprisonment, shipwreck. Uh, but he says not all, but it's his objective to suffer in all ways like Jesus. It, it tells us to turn our standards around in a sense. And he is, from what we understand, uh, he was given the opportunity to suffer uh, death for the sake of Christ, that this imprisonment he's in now, he's not gonna get out of. So it's, a, it's really a challenge. Uh, by the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. <laughs> uh, he has a purpose for each one of us. And uh, sometimes it'll involve suffering. Uh, <clears throat> his own purpose. We're, we're, we're not where we are necessarily because we're God's pet children, if you will. He loves us, each one individually, but he has a purpose for us. And he has a life forever for us. Uh, this grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the, the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He's destroyed death. There's still death, the separation of the body and the spirit. And that's a fearful thing to us. It's still a, a perhaps Satan's most powerful weapon fear of death. We want to hang on to life at any cost. 
or as the Lord says, you know, don't have that attitude. Be willing to do what you need to for Jesus. Uh, and God will, will take care of life and the immortality uh, in his time brought about the appearing of Jesus. And in this gospel, I was appointed a herald, an apostle, and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard that which I have entrusted to him for that day. We could sing that verse, right? We could sing that many, many times. I know whom I have believed. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so Paul in chains, and he's going to refer to the fact that he's in chains, is able to write that with confidence and uh, say that he's not ashamed said last time, how would it, what would it be like to be chained to Paul? I think you hear a lot of preaching, mm -hmm. a lot of prayer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what have you heard, what you have heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Uh, we've been entrusted with what? Gospel. The gospel, yeah. What are, what are we, do we uh, view it in that light? Or is it you know, something that is just, well, the gospel it is something that we get, we benefit from. We get blessings. But is it something that we've been entrusted with? To do something with it. Just as Jesus said uh, with the parable of the talents, you know, use it. Use the talents. And uh, use the gospel. Anyway, it's just a, a reminder that it should be a part of our lives, a part of our conversation, a part of uh, the way we live from day to day. Sometimes in, in you know in this in this time, you know, we might be kind of complacent about it and think, well, surely there's nobody in the world who hasn't heard the gospel because of you know all of, at this time yeah. there probably were people, there would have been people oh, who yeah. had Many. heard the gospel, and so it would really oh. seem like a very uh, a sacred thing that that we know about it and we need to let other people know but now maybe you know people think you know everybody's heard about it but then you know we have to remember well okay maybe they haven't heard about it in the yeah. the right way or uh, it's it's just not we have to keep reminding about it and that that's what we're trusting in a sense, I think we can conclude that a generation has a and that doesn't know the Bible and doesn't know uh, about Jesus. Have you heard a few things? Years ago, I, I, one of the major messages of the church when I was a youngster, which is a long time ago, was how do you convert people from denominational Christian into the church. Uh, but, it, and, you know, that was kind of the focus of a lot of the Bible studies that were published. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of teaching along that line. But it was kind of an unstated assumption 
that most people had a pretty good idea about who Jesus was. But I think in our society today, that's not the case anymore. Maybe it wasn't back then either. Uh, and it was just an assumption. But it's more uh, getting to be more like it was in the first century, if you will, where the mass of people really don't know much about Jesus. Uh, Maybe they've heard the name. Maybe they've heard it in what's depicted as a negative. Uh, because there's been so much misinformation. There's been so much perversion of the message uh, over the years. Fifty percent of people used to go to church, so at least you were. That's right. Yeah, passively there or something. Yeah. So people that never do anything. So it affects how you approach things. Uh, God, you know that everyone in the province. Oh, here it is. Guard the good deposit. Okay. You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phagellus and Hermogenes. Verse 15. How'd you like to be mentioned by Paul in that context that some have kind of fallen away and deserted me? Uh, in contrast, may the Lord show mercy to the household of Anesiphorus because he often refreshed me. <coughs> and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. I guess it wasn't the easiest thing to get into that uh, prison where Paul was. Uh, may the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. So it's interesting that the word does get around. There was communication. People would travel back and forth and uh, kind of amazing. They didn't have a telephone and things like that or uh, instant message. But I uh, hate to be one who abandoned Paul. Any, any other comments about that? Chapter, uh, perhaps Onesiphorus was converted by Paul. Uh, um, question, uh, at least me, um, how do you pronounce genus? What's that? Uh, However you pronounce it, yeah. Or my genie, I don't know. Uh, what, 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 uh, what kind of leaders were they? What kind of what? what were they leaders? We don't really know uh, what what their situation was. Maybe they uh, were supposed to come and visit Paul and didn't do it, or he says uh, they've deserted me. Maybe they're in Rome. Those are Latin names. <laughs> That's that Greek or Latin, I think. But uh, what would you, what would they consider the province of Asia? That would it be like Turkey. Turkey, yeah, uh, Western Turkey, where Ephesus, Ephesus was the capital of the Roman province of Asia. Uh, everyone in Asia is saying, "Boy, that's a lot." I don't know what. Uh, how would they have uh, deserted Paul? I don't know. Maybe they did. Were they expecting everybody to come to Rome and visit him? I, or is he? These people have deserted him by falling away from the faith. You know, there were Christians in Ephesus because Timothy, from what we understand, is working there. Uh, so not everyone in the whole church has fallen away, but somehow yeah, they all uh, all ministry evidently. Yeah, yeah. How uh, have they deserted Paul? Maybe they've uh, 
maybe he's heard that they kind of, you know, condemned him or, you know, don't respect him anymore. Maybe that's the way they've deserted him and kind of turning away toward false teaching. He's going to get at that in the later chapters of this book. Uh, that some people have said the resurrection has already come. They're just kind of drifting away from the, the gospel uh, that he preached. I think maybe that's it. They've kind of gone into some. Well, we know today that uh, <coughs> Turkey is a Muslim country. Yes. But uh, were, were they Muslims? They wouldn't have no. done that. No, that didn't come right. Right. This was a Greek area. They spoke Greek. And uh, even on into, well, and even on into the 20th century, uh, Greek, uh, some of the cities of Eastern Turkey, of uh, Western Turkey, had tremendous Greek populations like Smyrna, which uh, anyway experienced a tremendous uh, persecution in the year 1922. But anyway, we won't go into that. Um, but it's kind of a, you, you, how do you like to be categorized as one who's deserted Paul? <clears throat> you know. I think it takes many forms, you know. Yeah, I think and it, it's been a constant problem since the beginning of the church. Yes. Still, he'll still hear sermons on once in a while. Uh, the temptation to drift, you know, it's so easy to do. There's so many temptations out there that we can get into. And we've seen it here at Northwest. We've seen people drift away over the years. I got to name some names you could too. People that were, were once thought solid Christians, you know, they seem to have some maturity. They're raised in the church. And, and they've been here for many years, and yet now they're gone. They're still out there. They're out there in Chicago somewhere. But it, yeah. If we gone. Have, they drifted. Every person who was a member of the church would show up in our building. Yeah, yeah we'd be amplified. We'd, we'd have to have a uh, on the church. Yeah, yeah. So many but, no, it, it's a constant thing. Yeah. I've seen it. It's sad. It's very sad. Because <clears throat> people have come to know the truth. They, they were convicted of it at some point, and yet other things crept into their lives, and they, they just let it go. It's sad. And I think we can hurt. see how Paul uh, imprisoned there and chained to a guard may have taken this very personally. That this, you know, that they've rejected him by drifting away. And I'm sure that we we sometimes perhaps do that too when people drift away or and I'm sure our, our ministers feel that way almost a personal loss. Patrick has mentioned that uh that, that would indicate, I think, a person is more converted to the preacher than it was to Christ. Well, yeah, they but more still, personality. Can we talk about that? Yeah, yeah. The church was adhering, adhering to certain personalities instead of Christ. Yeah. And that that's always going to lead you down the wrong path. The preachers come and go. Let's face it. Jesus is forever. But if you put a lot of effort into a, a person and a relationship and then it kind of you know, falls away. You, you know, you can say, well, it, it's, I did all that I could, but you still want, like your children sometimes, yeah. they don't do exactly what you would like. You feel that personally. They rejected me. And, uh, you know, people can say, well, you did all you could and you took them to church. But still, you're going to have that feeling of, of being deserted. I think Paul in this situation is a beginner's and acknowledging those people there. You see, many people come to the church with a different mindset. Okay. Different mindset, like uh, caught fast, you want to see something. Sometimes that's how people feel. Some, because if you see what is happening here, Paul is in chain. Then they rejected him. They turned their back on him. Yeah. He, he, yeah. They were looking for <laughs> you preach your gospel to us, you preach Jesus to us. How I mean, 
powerful Jesus Christ is, how miraculous Jesus Christ is, but you are in chain. You are in prison. <clears throat> Why? I mean, God, I mean, Jesus do something or this kind of thing. So okay. people come to the church with a different mindset of belief that they have. Yeah. They think things happen the way they want it to happen. Okay. They don't have the faith yeah. that this is how things must change. But the true ones, you see that they have the spirit in them. The spirit will work with you. If the spirit will work with you, you will never reject anybody. No matter how the fellow fall into trouble or even get into problem, a problem that affects the fellow himself or caused by himself and get into it. If he is your brother in Christ or your sister in Christ, you will not turn your back on him. You will know very well that yeah. now through the spirit we have that sort of temptations or troubles that will come by. So if someone fell into that temptation, yeah. I don't need to turn my back on him or her. I should stand by her. I should stand by him to see him through. You see, so if you don't have the faith, you will be ashamed of her approaching the fellow. Yeah. I think you hit on something that uh, there's a misconception about the church sometimes that if you become a part of the church, everything's going to be great. You won't have any problems. Exactly. And then to see the champion of, of Paul in prison mm -hmm. is kind of a jolt to, to that attitude. You know, we, we preach that things will be better in your life, and then, you know, somebody gets arrested or maybe. <laughs> You get arrested Amen. yourself. So, anyway, uh, chapter two. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Entrust to reliable preachers. Pass it on, in other words, uh, that uh, we're one generation away from extinction, if you will, if the message is not passed on. Um, and then he uses um, metaphors, three different metaphors. In fact, <clears throat> endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Uh, anybody who, here's a soldier. <laughs> uh, does, any, does a soldier ever get involved in civilian life? <laughs> yeah, but they regret. Yeah. don't get uh, Barbara's uh, son is not a soldier, but a sailor in the U.S. Navy. Uh, so she's had some experience there. But uh, uh, there is a discipline, isn't there, that uh, follow the orders, endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Uh, so that's one metaphor. The church is an army, if you will, uh, following a commander, not getting involved in civilian affairs. <laughs> you know, your purpose is something else. Uh, what's the next metaphor? Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. So the, the second metaphor is athletics, that Christianity like athletics. Paul mentions that before you train hard like an athlete, you make sacrifices to win that race. They didn't have baseball, and football, and basketball, but they did have races. Uh, I don't know if they had team sports or not. They probably had wrestling. Yeah, wrestling, yeah, yeah. certainly. Yeah. 
Because, uh, no, I don't, that's what I'm just saying. I'm not sure they had team sports that he's referring to, but it, it's true. I think what Paul's using here is a sermon illustration. Okay. Um, it's he's referring to something with which his audience would have had experience and would have known. I mean, they would have been, you know, interested in the outcomes of races and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> then, uh, <clears throat> okay. So there's uh, the the training according to the rules. Uh, if anyone competes, he does not receive the victor's crown unless it competes according to the rules. What are the rules? What Paul is telling and preaching to Timothy, uh, we train hard, but have to follow the rules and how you present the word. Anyway, I could say a lot about athletics. I tell I have some friends in Boston training uh, to a great extent. I say, I want to be involved in a game that everyone, where everyone can win. Not that, you know, what we are is one winner and then everybody else is a loser. But anyway, that's, a, that's another part of it. What's the third metaphor he uses? Farmer. Farming, the hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. What's the lesson for the farmer there? Well, hard working. Hard working. Steady. When, when I read it, uh, <clears throat> I thought about how a um, farmer has to rise before sun, sun up. Oh, okay. And they work until sundown. Yeah. They got to get crops going. Uh, to other markets or whatever, and it's just like work around the clock. The okay. farmer, I, I think the farmer has to have a lot of faith too. Okay. In the weather, because <laughs> the weather determines whether he's going to be successful or not. They're going to, they're going to either they're not. So they have to have a lot of faith. Most farmers are, are Christian, that I found. And that's just there's some atheists out there, but uh, most of them are Christian, and they, and they pray to God for rain and, and for the good seasons and. and it keeps you going, you know. So they, they live by faith you know, to a large extent because of the, the business they're in. And I'm thankful for farmers because how do we wouldn't be eating drink yeah. that's right. you know, But I think they're people of faith, most of them. Should be the first to receive a share of the crops. <laughs> in other words, there's a reward. And, uh, yeah. So the Lord has a reward for the hardworking farmer. Works from sun to sun, like you say. Remember, Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel for which I am suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Um, Jesus raised from the dead, descended from David. Why does he mention that? Yeah, well, I was just going to ask that. Why descended from David? Well, there's in Ephesus and uh, in, uh, in Rome too, there's a lot of Jewish people. So he's trying to tie the Messiah into uh, the Jewish lineage, which is, and to say, yes, he is the descendant of David who was prophesied. I was just uh, my favorite, or one of my favorite psalms on that subject is the 89th psalm. We studied that in a uh, series of lessons on prophecy, but it contains so many verses. Uh, well, let's see, I wrote them down. <laughs> Find out. Verses three and four. Uh, I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you established your faithfulness in heaven itself. You said, I've made a covenant with my chosen one. I've sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm from all generations. And uh, it goes on. 
in that same psalm. Uh, I will take, uh, verse 28, I will maintain my love to him forever and my covenant with him will never fail. I will establish his line forever, his throne as long as the heavens endure. And uh, one, just one more person, starting verse 33. Uh, I will not take my love from him, nor will I ever betray my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have uttered. Once for all, I've sworn by my holiness, and I will not lie to David, that his line will continue forever, and his throne endure before me like the sun. Uh, or proof of seeing that he said it. If some can violate my commands, I will still keep my covenant. Anyway, that's one of the uh, clearest of the prophecies concerning the eternal kingdom of David. And so he, I think, mentions that here for the Jewish conference. But uh, anyway, God's word is not chained, even though Paul is limited. Uh, he's, he's still preaching there, but he can't get around as much. Um, Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. I endure everything for the sake of the elect. I guess he could have got out of it, perhaps. Talk. He was a good talker. He might have talked his way out, but he didn't. I don't know if that's what he's saying, but uh, <clears throat> he doesn't say it so many words, but he's saying he's not petty, he's not a petty person. Yeah. He is enduring hardships for the, the cause of Christ. Yeah. Setting an example for us, you know, I, I don't think any of us have ever had to endure anything close to what he's doing. Yeah. I hope we don't, <laughs> but yeah. we might be called on to do that someday. You never know. Uh, but he's setting an example here for us, too. As, as, as this is kind of his swan song, as I said last week. This is his last word to all of them. Yeah. So me. he's saying, hey, I've endured this. You know, you need, you might have to do the same thing. Yeah. I haven't led a petty life. Uh, no, nothing about Paul is petty. Everything is serious, seems yeah. like. And That's right. Sure, deep. So he's setting a model for us, I think. And he, he pushes the envelope. He's confrontational. And he will not back down. Uh, we recall some of the incidents in his missionary journeys where uh, he encounters persecution and opposition and uh, the brethren sometimes have to say, Paul, you got to get out of town. But he wants to stay. You can almost hear him arguing with them. No, I, I'm not leaving, but they just about drag him out of town to save his life. Anyway, uh, here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, he, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. We talked about that on Wednesday night, the other night. Uh, what does it mean to reign with Christ? Uh, the apostles were told they would sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Christians are saying we will judge the world. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. So those are some powerful words. That's probably a good place to... <laughs> Uh, stop. The, the next paragraph, a workman approved by God. We'll start that next time. All right, we'll take up there next week. We'll yeah, see. okay. Yeah, yeah, we we got, section. Uh, Michelle and I and Matt will be out of town visiting our daughter in New York.